Hey there everybody. Today I'm going to go over bowl coring, bowl coring setup, and the entire process from start to finish using the one-way easy core. Um, I have used all the other coring systems that are available out there commercially. In my opinion, the one-way is not only the best design, but it's the easiest. The name's pretty accurate. So I'm going to go over everything from how I prepare a blank for coring to how I set up the the base unit and each individual knife and I'll just go through the whole process walk you through it and hopefully um, if you have a one-way system and you struggle with it it'll help and if you're searching for a coring system um, it'll give you a good idea of how this one works I have no affiliation with one way I'm just you know a happy customer that's used their product for a lot of years first step is having a properly fitted tenon so i did a video a couple weeks ago about how to fit a tenon properly um, this one could be a little bit tighter here but uh, it's close enough a, a general rule you want the the tenon when you're doing coring to be at least 50 percent of the diameter this is a little on the small side uh, to be fair most of my work, well, all of my own work is green to finish. So I don't like doing a reducing foot. Uh, these, however, are rough outs. I do sell them to other wood turners once they're dried. That's the case for this. I just tend to have a smaller tenon and that is probably wise, but I've done this a long time and haven't had any issues. So, all right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is just clean up this face. Thankfully, I use a, a, a sawmill for almost all my bulb production. So my blanks are almost perfectly parallel all the time, but I still clean off, off the face. It's just a little bit easier to mark up. So I'm gonna do that first. Now that I've got a nice clean face to work with, I will measure the blank. This one's 16 and a half inches. So general rule is you want your wall thickness of your rough outs to be about 10% of your diameter. Um, if, if I were doing, if I were making these just for me, uh, which I don't do twice turn bowls personally, unless it's by a special, special order, um, I would make them a little thinner than that, but because I sell these, I tend to leave them a little bit thick. Um, it just gives uh, the end worker more room to work with, more, uh, more ways to turn it into a shape that they would prefer. So I just take my dividers, you know, make sure I'm yeah, about an inch and three quarters, and I'm gonna come in here and mark that first blank, and then I'll mark for the curve, and then the, the remaining ones, I'm just going to guesstimate the thickness, just eyeball it. So there's my first, there's the perf. Second bowl, perf, and third. So anything that's under seven inches, I generally don't save. I just don't have the need for such a small piece. And this is, yeah, six and a half ish. So next step, I'm gonna come in here with a bowl gouge and I'm gonna, you know, cut a channel where that, that uh, the coring knife goes in. Um, and I do it for two reasons. One, it makes it really easy to set that knife into the, into the space. And two, I'll go a little bit wider than the curve for that cutter. And basically I'll slightly round over the edge of the blank um, it just helps with drying. Uh, don't end up with that real sharp corner. And uh, you know, generally that's where you'll come into issues. So I'm just going to mark these. And then instead of removing this with a knife, I'll generally just turn it away. Um, I'll go deep enough to remove the, the hole where the screw check was. Um, 
and sometimes a little bit deeper depending on the ultimate depth of the, the blank. Um, I don't want to go too deep, but I don't worry if this first blank isn't completely even in wall thickness. These smaller ones just about never crack. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and remove set the base unit in place. All right, so these base units come in different sizes, basically different heights, and it's for, based on the swing size of your lathe. So I have a Robust American Beauty, it has a 25 inch swing. They don't make one of these in a 25 inch capacity. The biggest one they have is a 24. So basically, if you have a lathe where, you know, your measurements don't line up, most of them do, um, you can just make yourself a spacer. So there's a almost an inch long chunk of steel on both sides of this just to bring that level up. Um, and then from there, you have your knife sets. So this is the number one knife. Um, each knife set has the cutter holder knife and then the corresponding knife that supports it as it goes through the cut. So the cutter goes on the right, the support knife goes on the left, and each knife has kind of a happy range of sizes that it will do a sweet spot. So this is knife one. It's about nine by three and seven eighths, I believe. Uh, from there, knife two is uh, 11 and a half by five, uh, knife three is 13 and a half by six and a quarter, I believe. And then knife four, which I almost never use, is 16 and a half by seven, seven and a half, I think. Um, so what you'll notice with those sizes, each one gives you almost, a, it just a little bit over an inch or an inch and a quarter, but in depth differences between the size of the knives. So, if you were to leave this base exactly where it is and change out each knife, you know that the bottom thickness, you're gonna be an inch to an inch and a quarter. Uh, you're gonna have that much depth left in each blank. So kind of a, a good thing to keep in the back of your mind. Um, this blank is six and a half inches deep. So I'm gonna take Knife one is gonna cut this blank out first. I will probably cut it about three and a half inches deep. Then I'll take, um, most likely, I will skip knife two. Uh, it's just not gonna quite give me the depth I need. So I'll go right to knife three to cut this one. And this one I will cut at uh, five and a half inches deep, give or take. Um, that'll give me an inch at the bottom plus the tenon. Uh, so it'll be not completely even wall thicknesses the whole way around, but it'll be very close and it'll make the most of the available depth that I have. So uh, first step, and this is the most important one. All right, so most crucial step in setup, you wanna make sure that the height of this cutter, the top of the cutter is just slightly above that center point because this works just like a scraper and the rules for the scrapers, you're always going to want to stay above the center point to avoid catches or catastrophic catches. Um, so keep that knife just, just slightly above that center point. And then the support knife rides on top. Or ride, yeah. The support knife rides below this. You want that to come just to that same height so you can feel some support there, but you're not bumping over the top of it. So, all right, so now 
I know that this blank is six and a half inches deep. I know that I don't want to take this first one down to the full depth that it's capable of cutting, which is what three and seven eighths. So I'm going to go to about three and a half on this. So I'll measure, leave about a half inch of space between the post and the bowl blank and then just slide over until I meet that kerf that I made. Tighten the unit down, and then this support knife gets moved over directly underneath that cutting tip and anchored down. All right, and then we are ready to start corn. So I don't have a speed indicator on my lathe I, I will say that you want to core at a much slower speed than you turn. I tend to turn at a slower speed anyhow, uh, but this, um, you know, I would say I'm probably at 200 RPMs maybe. Um, and, you know, you want to make sure that your cutting tip is, is as sharp as it can get. Um, they do make a little jig to sharpen these. I, I don't have it. I just sharpen it by hand on a grinder just tap it real quick and just I clean up uh, the front point and the bottom of that cutting edge and then flatten the top and it freshens up all the edges so all right. so now that I'm all set up and ready to go I'm gonna start coring out and you'll see I'll clear the shavings frequently if it needs it usually at the beginning it'll clear itself um, Generally, I think that their their recommendation is that you stop once your the cutter head is completely inside of the bowl and then start adjusting the knife to support. I generally go about another inch further. I don't recommend doing that until you are very well versed and very comfortable with how this works and just get a good feeling for it. But here we go. Now this should never take a lot of force to cut. If it's taking a lot of force, something's not set up right. Your height is either too high, too low, or you're not sharp. So it takes very little pressure. I can do this with one finger. Generally, I'll keep a little bit of pressure here just to stop the knife from bouncing. So it's almost like I treat it like a ball gouge. So I'm pushing down, pretending this is a tool rest. You can see these shavings are having no problems clearing themselves. All right, so I'm in inch to an inch and a half at this point. I'm gonna move the support knife into place and it slides into that kerf and it has the same exact matching curve as this. So basically you just want it to be there for support and you want to, I generally just push it all the way until it hits the bottom of that cut and then I'll pull it out just a little bit. Tighten her down and then it's ready to go again. You know, if you get to this point, and you start the lathe again and you find that it's not cutting, chances are there's some shavings or something backed in there. So what I always do is I'll roll the blank backwards and then push the knife in as it starts to spin forward. generally stop 
and move that knife in about the time that this bar becomes straight over the circular part of the support knife. Um, if you're new to this, I highly recommend uh, stopping and adjusting more often. It'll just give you more support. Uh, but that's my general rule. So super easy, just push it in again, back it off a little, tighten it back up, and then just keep going. One more small adjustment, and this first one will be done. So I will generally stop the lathe before this blank comes free and just crack it out just so it doesn't go flying. Occasionally, if I'm feeling uh, <laughs> frisky, I'll let it fly and try to grab it. But uh, generally speaking, I find it's just better to stop a little early. <laughs> Probably good there. Yep, she's wiggling. So I'll just take my wrench, break that last little piece off, and there's the first one. So at this point, some people will come in with a gouge and clean this up. You know, I don't see the, the extra step being worth it, um, at least with these initial cores. Uh, once I get down to the main blank, I'll come in because the coring, the coring knife curve isn't going to completely match this curve. Um, you'll end up with very uneven wall thicknesses. So I'll come in, measure wall thickness, and correct that. So I will use a gouge on this last blank. All right, so I'm going to skip over. I'm going to skip over knife two because knife two only cuts to a depth of five inches, and I want to be about five and a half inches deep. So I will use the bigger knife here, which. We're a little on the small side, you know, we're almost 13 inches. Um, it'll work. So again, loosen up the base, loosen up the support arm, Oops. slide it into position. And I know, like I said, this bowl is six and a half inches deep. If I were to push that straight up against it's going to go six and a quarter inches deep it's going to leave me a quarter inch at the bottom which obviously is not going to be enough so because i know this cut six and a quarter and i want to be it's about five and a half i'm going to leave about three quarters of an inch between the bowl and the base unit three quarters thereabouts all right, over That's right where she wants to be, tighten it down, bring the support knife over just like before, right underneath that tip, tighten it down. And you're simply going to repeat the steps that you did on the previous knife size. And once again, I just put a little bit of pressure down here. You don't have to, I just prefer it that way and then it should take very little pressure to start cutting. You can hear that vibration. Those vibrations can get dangerous if you let them get too much. The bowl actually will start to wiggle and you'll end up going below that center point. So you want to make sure it and it would be, the vibration would be less if that tenon was bigger because I keep my tenons a little bit on the small side. I get a little more vibration. I just have to be a little more mindful of how fast I'm going. These bigger knives, as you come out further, it's putting a lot more pressure on this, so. tell from this video but I'm kind of going in spurts I give it a little pressure and let off 
Um, it's just the way I've always done it. I feel like it gives the, the lathe uh, enough time to recover and it gives your, sh your the shavings a little bit more time to clear. But I think it's like any tool, you know, for me at least personally, like I'll read instructions and then I'll do it as the instructions say and then I will find my own way that works for me better. Uh, not that my way works better, but it works better for me. All right, that's a good spot to stop and put my knife, the support knife into the kerf. Make sure that I'm lining up there. Tighten it down. And again, I always spin backwards just to make sure you have a nice clean spot where that knife goes in. Every species is a little different. Um, some species are going to eject the shavings a lot better than others. Um, maple's pretty good. Uh, softer woods can create an issue, so like butternut or um, I don't turn hardly any of it, but like cottonwood would be another where you're going to end up having to pull this knife out as you're going to clear it a little bit more often. Oops. Perfect example when you don't spin the bowl backwards, that knife goes in and hits some of those shavings and then just won't cut. About the time that this straight bar gets over top of this post, I'll take a stop, take a break, move that coring knife support in a little bit, tighten it down, and go again. And you can see where these shavings are kind of piling up there. That's why I'll spin this backwards. flying and just snap off that last bit and there we've got a really nice bowl blank the bottom is uh, inch 
inch and a half thick. It'll allow plenty of room for a tenon to go on here and then for it to be returned after it's dry. So now that I've got the coring part done, I'll come in here, I will clean this up and make sure my wall thicknesses are even with the ball gouge. And uh, you know, something I've seen people do that I don't do is you know, take these knives out and then put a tool rest into these holes and then just make a little set screw. Um, I find that it's just as easy, just as easy to just slide this out of the way. And I leave my banjo right behind here with the tool rest already in it. Help if I had the right one. curved one it makes life a little bit easier now I'll come in here and take my thickness tool see how I'm doing that one's just about perfect it's close enough so at this point this and the cores will come out I will coat the outside and the inside completely with anchor seal I'll sticker and stack them up and ones this thick will usually take you know four to five months to get down below 14 to 15%, I'll pop them in my little kiln at that point just to zap them down to seven and a half or well, seven, seven-ish um, is usually close enough. Um, and uh, you know, something I didn't mention earlier, uh, and this is not a necessary thing, but I tend to run my belt a little bit loose on this lathe when I'm coring, just so if there is a catch, the belt will slip rather than getting a catastrophic catch. I don't run it super loose, but just a little bit. If you have a lathe where that's an option, you can certainly do it. I would recommend trying it when you're starting out, especially. Um, that way, if you get a catch and it's bad, you're not gonna launch a bowl, break a knife, uh, et cetera. So anyhow, uh, I hope that helps everybody. Um, if you are ever uh, in need of dry bowl blanks, I do sell them. Uh, there'll be a link in this post in the notes that has uh, it's a link to my uh, my wood turning tip Tuesday newsletter uh, you'll get a 10% off code uh, for your first order and it'll take you to my website and show you the, the place where they're at um, they're all made of the same high quality stock that I use for my own personal works it's all forest ground uh, the only exception to that's black walnut generally speaking the walnut that I'm able to get around here are yard trees but I don't turn ones that are full of metal um, all my blanks are basically defect free. They're dried with no cracks. So if you ever need any help with them, let me know. And if you have any questions about this coring or any parts of the setup that didn't make sense or you don't understand, please leave a comment. I'll get back to you. Um, if we can't solve it during comments, I'm happy to email back and forth if you need some help. So anyhow, everybody, I hope that helped. Uh, you know, coring really is not a hard thing. It's not something to be scared of. This one-way system makes things way easier. Um, when I started turning and started coring, I was using the McNaughton system, which does work very, very well, but there's a lot of art involved in that instead of some simple measuring and math. Um, so anyhow, until next time, I uh, hope this helped. Have a good one, everybody. Take care.